Dit is Papa Alpha 0, Eco Tingo, Eco voor de Daily Minutes met een nieuwsupdate voor vandaag, 31 augustus 2016. Spullen zijn van woensdag. Vandaag is er Mosse en een SSTV plaatje in PD90. Er is vandaag nog wat weinig nieuws, dus ik moet helaas nog even improviseren met wat Engelse bijdragen. Ik heb drie items van de Engineer Guy. Today, video chatting on a phone seems natural, yet for years the public resisted video chat. The device in this photo, it's from 1964, shows the Bell Systems picture phone. Although you see grandma enjoying a chat with her daughter and granddaughter, very few people, let alone grandparents, use the device. Bell lost a half billion dollars. Here's the amazing story of the failure, but more important, near revolutionary success of the very first mass manufactured phone for video chatting. This device was meant to be the most revolutionary communication medium of the century, but failed miserably as a consumer product. In 1964, the mighty Bell system, the great monopoly that solely owned the telephone system, introduced the picture phone. They hoped that everyone would replace their voice-only phone with a picture phone, even though Bell charged $160 a month for the phone in its service, about a thousand in today's dollars. Technically, it was an amazing achievement. Bell used the existing twisted pair copper wire of the telephone network, not the broadband lines like today, to produce black and white video on a screen about five inches square. And amazingly for the time, it used a CCD-based camera which had size and height control so the image could be adjusted without moving the picture phone itself. To spark interest in the picture phone, Bell created picture booths in New York, Chicago, and Washington, D.C. to introduce the phones to the public at a cost of about 20 bucks a minute, over 150 in today's dollars. Bell hoped for a billion dollar business with a million phones set up by 1980 and 12 million subscribers by the year 2000. But in 1964, only 71 patrons used the picture booths in the first six months, and six years later, the number of users fell to zero. The picture phone itself limped along with a handful of customers until Bell withdrew it in 1978 after investing some 500 million dollars. The truly interesting aspect isn't the failure. The picture phone had the problems of any new invention, attracting users and producing enough to lower the cost. More fascinating to me than the failure is how close picture phone came to being the internet. In the 1950s and early 1960s, the Bell system engineers who designed the picture phone followed the speculations about a new coming media revolution. So they thought of an interconnected world, they knew that as long as customers used telephone lines only for voice calls, they had little reason to pay for broadband lines to the home. Copper would work well enough. But with picture phone, they could justify the cost of upgrading local lines. So they designed the picture phone to spark consumer interest and to generate cash to build an all-digital switch network to provide, in their words, a wide spectrum of consumer services, including picture phone. In fact, picture phone did deliver data in a proto-internet way. The phones connected mainframe computers, and an add-on let users share 35 millimeter slides and a flip-out mirror captured documents placed on a desk. The picture phone didn't do its job well enough. The video, although cutting edge for the time, was still choppy, and sharing documents on a 5 inch by 5 inch screen was less than ideal. The root of the failure lies in Bell's monopoly powers. It could not cross-subsidize the picture phone, introduce it at a low rate to build demand, because this would leave them open to charges of monopoly abuse. So in a way, the picture phone fit in nowhere. Too expensive for home, too limited for business, but it does remind us when looking at failure to look carefully at the details, because in them is often the path to the future. I'm Bill Hammack, The Engineer Guy. When I was 10 years old, my mother gave me an old Kodak Brownie camera. I was disappointed because it looked like a box with a hole in it. I didn't realize how this simple box revolutionized photography. Did it change the way American families think of themselves and recall their own histories? The Brownie camera was the brainchild of George Eastman. In 1871, this 17 year old bank clerk took up photography. It wasn't a simple thing in those days. In Eastman's own words, it took a pack horse load of equipment including a sink because making photos was messy business. It involved coating glass plates with egg whites. His first step was to get rid of the sink to make the process dry. Eastman worked in his mother's kitchen to make dry plates, even boiling his chemicals in her teapot. He went into business as the Eastman Dry Plate Company. 
Eastman felt he could make money from his plates, but only if there existed a small, simple camera to use them. This started him on a 20-year quest. His first camera in 1885 included a key feature, a roll of film. Eastman took coatings from his dry glass plates and transferred it to flexible paper. Although it was now inconvenient to take pictures, it cost $45 for the camera, an exorbitant price in 1885. Over the next three years, Eastman improved his camera, but it still cost $25, again too much, although it carried for the first time one of the greatest trademark names ever. To name the camera, Eastman looked for a simple word that could be pronounced in every language. Eastman's favorite letter was K. He said it was strong, incisive, firm, and unyielding. From this feeling, he conjured up Kodak. With profits from these cameras, Eastman spent 10 more years perfecting his ultimate camera, the Brownie. It sold for $1 plus 15 cents for film. In its first year, 1900, 5,000 of them flew off the shelves, spreading across the globe. In 1904, for example, when the Dalai Lama came down from his Tibetan capital for the first time, he brought with him his Kodak camera. In spite of the success of the Brownie, Eastman continued creating new cameras until he got a painful spinal condition that made him inactive. Always the man of action, Eastman made a plan. He tidied up his will, then asked his doctor to show him exactly where his heart was. In 1932, George Eastman shot himself through the heart, leaving behind a yellow-lined piece of paper with the words, To my friends, my work is done. Why wait? And what work that was. This year alone, Americans will take 70 billion photos, not simply photographs, but memories to be shared for years, all started by George Eastman and his brownie camera. No doubt during this Halloween season, you'll hear some movie or some recording that has this familiar yet eerie sound. That sound gave birth to the greatest gift from engineers to the arts, the electronic synthesizer. The synthesizer began in the 1920s with Professor Leon Theremin. In a Leningrad engineering lab, he played around with the latest technology, radio. It fascinated Theremin because radio changed electricity into sound. He brought two parts of the radio close together, so they made a sound like the squeal from putting a microphone too near a speaker. This propelled him, in his own words, to give these sounds a musical soul. He built an instrument where instead of physically bringing the two parts together, the performer's body would create the squeal. He would just wave his hands in front of the instrument, plucking music from the air. You've likely heard the theremin, as the instrument became known, in the 1950s sci-fi classic, the day the earth stood still. But well before that, Theremin toured the world and captured headlines. The New York Times called it ether music. The Chicago Tribune said that Theremin mysteriously reproduces music. Einstein called it as significant as when primitive man produced sound from a bowstring. The instrument made quite a splash until 1938 when Theremin disappeared abruptly. Kidnapped by Soviet agents, he was sent to a labor camp until he agreed to work for the KGB. But Leon Theremin had planted a seed. In the late 1950s, a 14-year-old boy built a theremin from plans he found in a magazine. By age 20, he began making them commercially, selling enough to pay for his engineering education. The student, Robert Moog, used what he'd learned about electronic music from the theremin and built in 1964 the world's first synthesizer. With Moog's synthesizer, the child of Leon Theremin's wonderful instrument, Electronic music became world famous with one of the best-selling classical albums of all time, Switched On Bach.
Daily Minutes zijn dagelijks vanaf ongeveer 1900 uur te beluisteren via PI2NOS.